welcome everyone to the next episode of A Zoom with a View. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by two of my Penumbra colleagues from the Angus team. Um, and so today we're joined with um, uh, by Eve Anderson, who is one of our peer workers, and Lindsay Wilson, who is one of our recovery practitioners. Um, welcome to you both, and thanks for joining us today. Um, today we have on the agenda the issue of stigma in mental health. Um, I think one of the things to, to say initially when we start this conversation is that, you know, we've come so far in tackling negative attitudes in mental health and we've, we've done so much great work um, here at Penumbra and also working with um, partners um, in the, the anti-stigma movement. Lindsay, I just wonder, just coming to you um, initially to kind of start the conversation, I wondered if we could maybe kind of find out from you and, and, and get your thoughts on you know, why the anti-stigma movement is, is still very much needed. In yeah, um, sure. Um, well, thanks for having us. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, yeah, I think at the moment um, it's very much needed still because we we are still hearing when we're supporting people. Um, we're still hearing this idea of that their friends and their family, people that they associate with, say to them, you know, oh, I don't believe in mental health. I don't believe in mental illness. And that's coming up quite a lot and um, it's quite concerning and um, it can be a bit dangerous I, I, I believe and I feel like it's um, it's putting the idea out there that there's something to believe in in the first place um, it kind of casts a shadow of doubt on, on people's minds straight away from the outset um, I mean mental health is real and as someone who lives with um, mental illness myself um, from day to day I, I it shouldn't be something that's questioned or treated with any type of suspicion at all um, and I feel like it, it's the danger part of it is it makes people retreat and they don't reach out for support you know they don't try and you know seek um, therapy or go and see their doctor it makes it's like a shame and a guilt that's attached to it um, and I think um, too often like those living with mental health disorder or an illness um, it's been seen as something to fear you know they should be afraid of someone that's got it because of um, maybe they've got displaying a behavior that's not quite familiar um, uh, but the irony is I mean the human condition like we are programmed to fear the unknown um, so we're genetically programmed to always be on high alert you know when we're faced with um, something that's unfamiliar to us so it's understandable um, I think it's important to say as well it's understandable that um, the public, general public, will be a little bit suspicious or judgmental, but that's a natural reaction. And I think the the whole point of us coming together today and talking and the importance of it is just to educate people um, and teach them. And then, um, you know, what can we do to, to help you learn about different conditions or mental health on a broad scale? Um, so, yeah, it is still very much needed. Um, and hopefully we can do something together today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting that you're talking about you know, the fear of the unknown, because I think a lot of that is, is true. You know, people, if they don't really know or if they're not familiar with something or if maybe heard something that's quite negative about mental health, they kind of, that almost kind of sticks in their mind. Um, and I think as well, I don't know if this is your experience, but I don't know if maybe, um, you know, part of the impact of, Kind of those negative views um, might be that loved ones, friends, colleagues are um, reluctant to strike up that conversation with someone about mental health. Is that something that you you find? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I remember the one of the people I spoke to a while back who was talking about you know um, their their parents didn't believe in mental health. Mm -hmm. um, it was because there was it was never talked about. You know, and it was, I don't know if it's, I think across families and, you know, the generation that's changed now, I think people are more open to it because in the public eye, people are being more talkative and, and generally being more open. But I still feel there's that group of people who are just scared to talk about it because they don't know what's going to, they don't want to open the can of worms because they don't know what's going to come out. Like they might not be able to, um, they, they might feel that they're not able to support the person when they come out with this information they're like oh what do i do now <laughs> you know they're they're they've got holding it all within them as well so yeah there's definitely um 
there's definitely some sort of um, fear around that also. Mm. People just don't talk mm. about it. Um, and actually, probably a lot of the time, you know, when people have that fear about coaching, what it oftentimes is kind of seen as an awkward subject, you know, that you, we always sort of say that, you know, you don't have to be, not that you would obviously, you know, um, take that position of giving advice to someone, but in a kind of, you know, loved, in, a, in your sort of capacity as a loved one, you know, you can ask how someone's getting on, you can see how they're, they're doing, and even actually just having that conversation with someone, allowing them the kind of space, giving them that space to, you know, open up and just have an honest conversation about how they're feeling might be enough to kind of say, well, you know, you've had that conversation, it might give them the confidence to then go and seek support if that's what they need to do. It's not even, it's not even as if we've just got like one stigma, there's a bunch of different mm -hmm. stigmas, but I mean, they fall into two categories. You've got the self stigma and you've got social stigma. So social stigma is what everybody else is thinking and um, what's going on here. And then the self stigma, like you just said, it's about internalizing that. So what, why am I like this? What have I done? Like, how are people seeing me? Um, and that, I think that comes from somewhere. That doesn't just come out of thin air. You know, it, it comes from um, sort of your surroundings, maybe how you grew up, um, people you went to school with, work with. It's been all those attitudes that have just kind of been kicking about. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do feel it's it is really important um, to try and well, I think to identify that there's not just that one stigma. There's a bunch of them out there. Uh, one thing that's actually um, taken back to what you were saying before about being okay and opening up and people feeling confident. Even I were talking recently about um, asking someone if they're okay, but doing it like twice. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, Eve does it to me. She did it the other day with me. She's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And then she's like, no, are you okay? Like you ask it again. because. And then I was like, actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not feeling that great. So I think, you know, there's little tips, tactics, things that you can kind of create come up with to to get answers from people to get them to talk and mm -hmm. you know I just thought that was quite that's quite a nice one mm -hmm. and I suppose the other thing is as well is that when you have that conversation with someone I don't think that you know people kind of sometimes forget that you know you're not sort of if you're the person asking you're not being expected to you know you don't have to have all the answers or solutions or you know anything like that I actually just you know, having that conversation with someone and giving them the freedom to sort of speak freely about how they feel is actually maybe at that time, at that moment in time, all they, they maybe need. Eve, I wonder if I can maybe pull you in at this point and have a chat about, because you work um, as a, a peer worker, um, yeah. as we said at, at the start there, so you draw on your, your lived experience to support people accessing your service. I just wondered, uh, can, can we maybe get your thoughts on you know how you feel about the the power of peer um in terms of using that to kind of tackle um stigma yeah absolutely i think that being a peer worker for even as a worker it really really has such a um big impact on my own well-being and the way that i feel and i think that it's it allows you to almost um advocate for the people that you're supporting you know that sort of when you can say to someone that you know I actually I can understand how you're feeling it's not that there's like we've been walked down the same road it's more that sort of parallel to the feelings or maybe the emotions even or just you know on some level it's not someone saying to you you know this is what's wrong with you and you need to be doing this it's like look I can you know really validate in how they're feeling um, and I think with the peer element, I think it just is really, really, really beneficial. I think because you're not someone who's like maybe more in a clinical setting. And again, it's that sort of almost, I wouldn't like to say maybe dictated, but you know, um, as a peer, you potentially can understand on a more personal level. And I think that that's what it comes down to really. It's about, you know, sitting with someone and saying, that you know it does get better it does get easier um and that i think it's just really really important and with maybe just there what lindsay was saying about the stigma and stuff as well i think that as a peer worker when you're saying to someone this is my job and i have lived an experience and i'm here to help you that is it, it almost enables them to you know have that hope again to be like right okay well this is something that i can get through and um, you know, it opens the door massively for people. 
I think. I think that's a really important thing that I would always sort of try and bring to the table quite early on is that it's it is recovery focus like you know that's in with you know being a peer worker as well you're almost that not um, well maybe that sort of proof almost that it is something achievable that yes it's difficult and it's something that's not a linear it's not directly up all the time it's something that's going to be challenging in different ways but it's more about managing the challenges and being able to sit with them and you know having the tools to work through them and stuff and when it's someone that you can you know it's not like you're coming to me and I'm in any way like I would hope anyway I would like to think that by being a peer worker and explaining that it is you know through lived experience that I do my job role that it sort of takes away that you know that need for feeling worried about stigma and stuff like that really that's why I would really really hope it almost dissolves that as much as is really possible um, I would hope anyway that's what I'd like to think. How do we how, how do you think we should go about kind of normalizing that conversation around mental health? Lindsay what's your, your thoughts on that? Yeah so I think it comes um, I think it comes around to again not judging people so understanding that you know, not because you're not in the, say, for instance, you haven't had a disorder or an illness, you haven't grown up with that, or um, you haven't experienced it, so you might not know some of the terminology. It's like when somebody starts a, a new job and they put the acronyms in there, <laughs> like, you, you might not know what CBT is or DBT or uh, BPD or, you know, all of these sort of things. And as well, when we're talking about the sensitive issues, um, especially talking about suicide and, and um, the terminology you use there, a lot of people, they didn't like the the term you know commit suicide so it's died by suicide or they completed suicide and I think it is important especially in the media um for you to use the more sensitive language but when it's become when it's becoming a chat with your family and your friends and if you want to use the language that you're comfortable with and you you're you know it's, it's natural to you then you use that language um for instance like with me um there's a uh, stigma amongst lots of different disorders and illnesses but there's especially higher stigma in I would say schizophrenia, something like bipolar, um, a lot of personality disorders mm -hmm. uh, like for instance with me borderline personality disorder um, is an order is a disorder that's massively massively stigmatized um, even within the therapeutic setting amongst for healthcare workers um, and there's a whole labeling issue going on there at the moment uh, now it's called emotional but uh, emotional unstable personality disorder and that to me just gives me fear i don't like calling it that like i just call it you know fear borderline that's just what i've been i was diagnosed years ago and that's what i i think my illness has but um i think it's important for people to if they do, are comfortable with using eupd or bpd you know the sort of shortened versions and that's absolutely fine as well um but for me for instance the emotional to, to put the word emotion in a sort of illness or disorder, personality disorder, yeah, it doesn't sit very well with me. Um, it's like as well, emotions been attached to females in the past, They're like females being very emotional or hysterical, you know, what's up for, for that. Um, so again, I feel like it's bringing us back again, so it's throwing us back rather than pushing us forward. Um, but there's been some really intelligent discussions amongst the borderline community where um, dysregulation was a word that was used that we quite liked. So emotion dysregulation disorder or something, but again, don't like emotions, so maybe substitute that for something else. Um, so it's it's very healthy to have these conversations open, you know. Um, it just I feel like we'll get somewhere if we're talking about these sorts of things. What are your your hopes for the future in terms of um, the next steps and progress that we can make? For myself, anyway, I think that getting good sort of mental health education um and support to young people in schools whatever that looks like um so that they grow up knowing that it's not something to be worried about talking about so that they can access support um you know when they need to not when they're at crisis point um but really across the board more of that more um just first point of contact support for people um and really, really taking away that stigma by having that at the forefront of things, like viewing it the same as you do physical health, um, and further to be 
more opportunities for people to be speaking about the way that they're feeling without that sort of and not necessarily among friends and family because I can understand how difficult that it can be but more like services providing that space for people to speak that's what I think would be beneficial because it take that when there's a stigma there's the door is closed so if we can try and open as many of those doors as is possible to help people come and speak about how they're feeling and you know in groups as well when you recognize that you're not the only person who feels like that and it's not as in that that's um invalidating the way that you feel but more the actual the opposite of that it's like you know you this is something that you can like what Lindsay had said at the very beginning like there's still many people that are you know we speak to them and they're like oh well I didn't believe in mental health or I didn't know I had mental health it's like well that's that sort of allowing people to explore that um and really be validated and listened to. So I would hope. Yeah, I think even myself, we were having this conversation um, uh, and yeah, there was things that come up about, yeah, this, we we're talking about education skills and it were, uh, well, I was saying as well, it'd be good to have in your workplace to have like, maybe not, I don't know, they're talking about um, first aid, mental health first aid, but just somebody that uh, knows about certain things that's available to talk to or a safe space or just something you know in, in your workplace that might um, be helpful I know for me in the past it would have helped a lot mm -hmm. um and I think yeah in, in schools definitely if there's they've got somebody as well that the the, the younger ones can go to mm -hmm. and I think it's our responsibility like our generation um it's our responsibility to talk out and to say you know I've got this I've got that and this is how it affects me because I think that way if they're seeing us do it then they might feel comfortable start doing it within their own groups um you know in circles Lindsay, eve it's been an absolute delight having you on today um obviously we could talk for a lot lot longer yeah. than we have um but we're we're finishing it there today um and it's been a, an absolute delight having you on to talk about this really important issue um your insight has been so so brilliant um and hopefully maybe at some point in the future we can do another zoom with you um, but in the meantime, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, you too. See ya. See you later. Bye.